speaker. It's a pleasure to make this introduction. Many of you might remember Brent. He came to us here at Moss Landing from Kansas, where there was once an ocean a long time ago, to study marine biology. And you know, I thought I was, he was actually my first grad student um, here at Moss Landing, and I felt pretty honored because I was at Davis. And this young fella drove up to Davis to have a beer with me and tried to convince me to take him as a grad student. And I found out after I accepted him that apparently the assistant to the director at that time, Donna Klein, had informed him that I was a new faculty member and I might have some money. <laughs> so he read as many Cal papers as he could on the three hour drive to Davis and was able to successfully get himself in our lab. Um, it's important to note that he actually finished his PhD at Santa Cruz after here at Moss Landing faster than he did his Moss Landing master's thesis. <laughs> Unbelievable. That either means that we really tuned you up and shot him in there or, or he learned something. Um, I didn't want to make the introduction very long. Brent obviously did a great job at, at Santa Cruz. He did a great job here at Moss Landing. He's been at WSN and a variety of places. He's, he worked at uh, Ezer here with Jizzle Lawson, moved on to do his PhD with her and Pete and a whole bunch of others up at Santa Cruz. Um, and um, now is starting to be a postdoctoral fellow with Brian Shulman, who's up at the University of the East Coast. But just want to say that, you know, Brent's the first beer pig to ever come back here after doing his PhD. And so he's the first one that we get to inaugurate our, our beer pig rule. And that is that the, regardless of where you get your PhD from, we won't call you doctor <laughs> until you defend your research with us here. So. So Brent's on the hook, and afterwards we're going to go take him out and roast him <laughs> over pizza and beers. Um, but we are very excited to see uh, to see um, this next generation of Fight Club students going on getting their PhD and coming back and visiting us. And so I just want to welcome uh, Brent Hughes to Moss Lane Relabs to give the afternoon seminar. <laughs> Hey, thanks. This is great to uh, be here for, uh, this is like a homecoming for me. Um, the last time I was up here was eight years ago. Eight years, that's a, unbelievable. Eight years ago I was up here uh, defending my master's thesis. And so now I'm back. And when I was doing my master's with Mike, it was all about kelp and of course. Um, <clears throat> and then, but since then I've, I've transitioned into these murkier, environment, um, <coughs> specifically Elkhorn Slough, uh, so just right out here. And so this is really uh, eight, eight years, a little bit less, eight years summarized um, since my post uh, Moss Landing days. So this is actually pretty cool. <coughs> and so like I said, it's all about, it's a lot of, most of this is gonna be about Elkhorn Slough. And what's really cool about Elkhorn Slough is even though it's this tiny little system, um, there's a lot to be learned from it. And I'll be pointing out people in the audience and how they've kind of contributed to um, a lot of these studies along the way. Okay. <clears throat> so doom and gloom in the ocean. So if you look in uh, the, the, more, the recent marine ecology literature, you're gonna see that the, some of the more highly cited papers um, <clears throat> are all about doom and gloom. And they're all about collapse and the loss of species. And this is a, this is a, a good way to get a paper that's highly cited um, in the ecological journal. <coughs> and so you can see how many citations that each one of these has. And all these have uh, something in common. Can anybody tell me what that is? Doom and gloom. Doom and gloom. <laughs> they're all about doom and gloom. They're all published in science. And so there's, I figured out the recipe for getting uh, a publication in science. One, you find something that's widespread across the world that's in a state of decline. And then two, you write a story about it. <coughs> that's it, and you get a paper in science. <coughs> so anyways, the important, the important thing behind this is that yes, there are, there, are, there are things happening in the ocean and we are somewhat responsible for some of them. And, what I'm gonna to talk to you today about are estuarine systems and um, they come with a really high value. And more spe specifically, I'm gonna focus in on seagrasses and salt, marsh salt marshes. They're some of the more highly productive systems on the planet. <clears throat> and this, this guy, Carlos Duarte, um, who's a, a pretty famous marine ecologist, 
he, he's, he's been putting values, economic values to these ecosystems. And um, seagrasses and salt marshes have a really high value. And that's because they do a lot of important functions. They sequester carbon, they filter out contaminants, they provide habitat for important species, uh, they protect our shorelines from sea level rise, so they do these really important things. And <clears throat> when they're lost, it comes at a heavy price. And so it, if you add, do the numbers, it ends up being billions and billions of dollars every year that's lost just from these ecosystems that are declining. So <clears throat> we need to kind of understand what is driving these, de these declines in these ecosystems. And so what my research has been doing lately is moving beyond this whole doom and gloom aspect and looking at resilience. So <clears throat> here's an example here on, the, on our coast where, we, where the landscape, the coastal landscape is really dominated by uh, agricultural fields and human development. <clears throat> and so you can look at the ecosystem responses to this. So because you have this agriculture that it has, it produces all this nutrient runoff that gets into the water and creates eutrophication, <clears throat> that can have problems for the, the nearshore environments where you get hypoxia, you can get fish kills, you can get <clears throat> algal overgrowth of seagrasses. And then in certain cases, when you get land development in the coastal environment, you can get erosion happening. <clears throat> However, there are a lot of ecosystems uh, on the planet, they have the, these really strong anthropogenic drivers. Yet they, are, they also have these aspects of resilience or the, the capability of a system to recover or resist uh, a, a disturbance, right? And so some, in some cases you might, you might get fish that are able to survive in a hypoxic environment or you might get seagrasses that are thriving. <coughs> um, and then this example I'll talk to you about in a bit. And so, but first I'm gonna focus in on seagrasses. And so there's been a lot of research done on seagrasses um, in terms of putting them in this theoretical framework of what is the major drivers of these systems. And in a, in a system that's dominated by seagrass, where you have healthy, flourishing seagrass, it's usually characterized by a low algal biomass, um, so low algal competition. And then oftentimes, there's this high efficiency or abundance of mesograzers, and there are these grazers that are about yay big to you know about that big. <clears throat> and then sometimes there's a low efficiency of small predators. And so if you get a combination of this, you, you oftentimes can get a pretty healthy seagrass system. On the other hand, when you get eutrophication, um, which eutrophication is, in, uh, in its de the definition of eutrophication is actually a speed, an increase in the rate of carbon to a system. And it's usually associated with algal blooms. <clears throat> so you get this high algal biomass, and then that can lead to a shift in uh, competitive dominance between the two primary producers. And then at times, you can also have a low abundance of mesograzers keeping that algae in check, and then a high efficiency of small predators. And those small predators are like crabs and, and smaller fish. And so when they're overabundant, they can um, be highly effect effective predators on these mesograzers. So a big question mark in seagrasses and a lot of systems around the world have been what, what's the consequence of overfishing or the loss of top predators in these systems? Can they also have effects to um, <clears throat> the shift in balance? So we're gonna look at Elkhorn Slough as, as this model system uh, for looking at these eutrophic and top-down effects. <clears throat> and so just to give you a little bit of a description about what's going on, it's a highly eutrophic estuary. And it, like I said, the, the landscape is dominated by agriculture, right? Especially in the Lower Salinas Valley. And so <clears throat> the, it's dominated by these row crops and they're really expensive to grow. And so the, the practice for, for farmers is to throw as much nitrogen on those fields as possible because nitrogen is cheap and these crops and the land that they're growing it on are expensive. And so they don't wanna risk any sort of crop yield. So that's why we get this really high uh, nutrient loading in, in the water in the coastal environment. And so <clears throat> all this runoff ends up going into the Old Salinas River Channel, which is right here. And <clears throat> it's, it, it gets about a dump truck of nitrate fertilizer a day. So about a dump truck of nitrate fertilizer goes right past us 
every single day. <clears throat> and then the irony behind all this is that these lettuce row crops end up growing sea lettuce in the estuary. And Mike, you know all about this. There's <clears throat> every, every summer, you, this, the estuary can come, becomes completely blanketed in ulva. And it can create all sorts of problems. Okay, so <clears throat> my initial um, my, my initial desire to go study seagrasses was to look at this competitive shift and these competitive interactions between algae and seagrass. And <clears throat> I wanted to know, well, what's going on with the ulva and, and the eutrophication in Elkhorn Slough? And so these were actually some of my initial observations. I'm gonna show you two different systems. <clears throat> so this system up here, is an uh, un unhealthy seagrass bed, right? It's, it's loaded with epiphytes. The seagrass is brown, it's slumped over. Um, it's actually pretty short. It's just not a healthy system. <clears throat> There's a very few grazers in the system, so those animals that, that feed on the epiphytes. And if you look at a comparative system, you can see a nice contrast. So this is a system <clears throat> that the vegetation's upright, it's free of, of algal epiphytes, and it's characterized by these very large and conspicuous mesograzers. So this is Philoplesia taylor sea hare. And the shocking thing behind all of this is that up above is Tomales Bay, which is a really pristine estuary, and below right here is nasty polluted Elkhorn Slough. And so <clears throat> um, this, left me banging my head against the wall for um, many hours and days, trying to figure out why you could actually get this result in a system like Elkhorn Slough. <clears throat> and so I'm gonna take you through a little bit of how I kind of, the thought process behind all of this. And so <clears throat> here's Monterey Bay upwelling down here. And here, this is nitrate in micromolar. So Monterey Bay upwelling gets what? About 30 micromolar uh, at the most. Um, <clears throat> and so this is a time series of, of nutrients taken at uh, near the, the, the Highway 1 Bridge in Elkhorn Slough um, over a period of years. This was actually uh, collected by Kaye and Nybakken and, and colleagues actually Nybakken uh, in the mid 70s. This is monthly data. And then this is the Elkhorn Slough data set um, since taken since about 1989. And so what you see is an exponential increase in nutrients. And what we saw with that Nybakken data set is that nutrients started exceeding the background conditions of Monterey Bay upwelling in 1970. So right around the time that nutrients started taking off, eelgrass started declining dramatically in the system. And it was there was only remnant patches left in the estuary around, around 1980. Now, <clears throat> when I was starting to think about, okay, what's driving this? This seems like this could be a eutrophication effect. This, who knows? This is a period of resilience, and <clears throat> it's hard to say what was describing that. I looked at many different patterns, like erosional patterns of tidal prisms and um, <clears throat> El Ninos, all sorts of kind of big, <coughs> large-scale things. And one day, I actually got a data set from um, the slew safari guy, Jan. And so what, <laughs> what Jan does is Jan gives the old grandmother from Ohio um, a clicker. And so and he says, okay, every time you see a sea otter, click. And so you can imagine there's a tremendous amount of error in that data set. But <laughs> if that error is propagated through time, equally distributed through time, then it actually ends up being a good data set. And so, <clears throat> and especially if you're going out three or four times a day, every single day for 15 years. And so when I got that data set and I overlaid it on, onto the eelgrass, it pretty much fit like a glove. Now this is not Jan's data set right here, this is the USGS data set. But it was the same pattern. <clears throat> and so being a good phycology student, you know, I took this result back to my advisor and he kind of had a good laugh and he said, <laughs> Isn't this cute? Sea otters and sea grasses. <laughs> no way. And so then I went back to the drawing board, and <clears throat> every time I tried to put this P 
piece, the pieces of the puzzle together, it came back to the same solution, which was sea otters. And so I started testing this hypothesis of <coughs> what, how could sea otters be driving a trophic cascade that could lead to increased eelgrass health and increased resilience. And so to make the, this connection, <coughs> once again, I went back to Greg's data, which I've used throughout this, um, throughout my PhD, thanks Greg. Um, <coughs> Is, <laughs> is that so? What I did was try to make linkages to sea otters and and the seagrass. And so the, the 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 best linkage that you can think about are crabs. So when a sea otter moves into a system, it can completely decimate a crab population. Um, <clears throat> they are easy prey items for sea otters to grab. And so <clears throat> what we have right here again is a data set from the 1970s prior to sea otters moving into the estuary. And these are two species of crab, Cancer antimerius and Cancer productus. And this is 20 years after sea otters moved in. And what we can see is that the carapace width, the size of the crabs, were almost cut in half. And then right here, these are standardized tracks before sea otters and after. It's barely a blip on the radar. And so that's a, the several orders of magnitude lower in terms of biomass. I mean, there are harvesting big crabs out of the estuary in the 70s. It's amazing. Um, we don't see them now. <coughs> so here's how the mechanism, there's the mechanism how it works. So you get the, these large grazers, and these grazers are, these, they're almost like mutant grazers. You don't see grazers like this anywhere else on the West Coast in terms of the philoplesia and the idatia in this system. They get, the idatia gets really big in kelp forests, but not in the seagrasses. <coughs> You get a mesopredator like a cancer crab that can eat these guys, and that leads to unhealthy seagrass. And then you end up, add in the top predator, the sea otter, and that can generate this trophic cascade that leads to healthy seagrass. <coughs> so we looked at the many different ways to validate that what we're seeing is, is really true. And then <coughs> um, what we're really and ultimately interested in is this whole aspect of resilience. And so what we, were, we did some habitat modeling with um, folks from the um, <coughs> CSUMB uh, C4 mapping lab to look at the, the available habitat of eelgrass in 2006 and the actual seagrass extent. And then we repeated that, that step again by looking at the available habitat in 2012 using the Kavitech bathymetry surveys and then looking at the seagrass extent and looking at how, how fast or how much the eelgrass is actually expanded by. And that really cor correlates well with sea otter crab consumption. And so we, we took about 10,000 otter observations in all these different beds through that six to seven year period and we correlated it with the, the, the resilience of the system. And so <clears throat> it turns out that the more otter, the more crabs removed from the system, the more resilient that bed becomes. And then, but what's really kind of the, the next step in putting this all together we're look, was looking at these macroalgal mats. <coughs> and now these macroalgal mats are, are really, they, they really start showing up in these mudflat areas like around Seal Bend and these light green areas. And so <coughs> we get that in the summertime, that coincides with the, the same, at the same time when eelgrass is expanding. So it's usually a summertime expansion for eelgrass on this side of the coast. <clears throat> and so you get this radial expansion, so it kind of creeps out, right? They grow like strawberries rhizomatically. <clears throat> and so like I said, there are ovo blooms in, in Elkhorn Slough. I don't know if I need to really show you data to prove it, but um, here it is. Uh, so here's <clears throat> hectare, these are one hectare plots that we've been sampling um, throughout the estuary over a four year period. And we get these big peaks in the summertime, right? And so that's pretty consistent. And so the, the big question is, well, how, we know that the paradigm in, in seagrass has been that you get these ulva mats and seagrass usually doesn't persist very well in, in, in the face of these ulva mats. So we're wondering, well, can these trophic mechanisms potentially enhance the resilience in face of these, these algal blooms? And so I'm gonna take you through two different experiments um, <clears throat> to show you how this whole thing operates. And so we focused in on one bed, uh, which is Seal Bend, where we have the highest density of sea otters, 
some of the healthiest, most the fastest expanding seagrass. And we, we did a predator exclusion experiment. And so this is the first time we, people have actually been able to manipulate sea otters in the field, which is kind of a cool thing to do. This is one of the only systems where we think we can do it. Um, it's challenging as a kelp forest to run predator exclusion experiments. So right here, and this is, uh, th right here, the, these lines correspond to the, the edge of the zostera bed, so the eelgrass zostera. And so this red was 2009, blue is 2012, ye yellow is 2013, and it's expanding into these areas dominated by ulva at a rate of about eight me meters per year. And so we ran an experiment in 2012 in the interior, and then we re repeated that experiment at the edge in 2013. <clears throat> now, this is the profile of that ecotone between ulva and zostera. So as you move towards the ecotone, you get less ulva, and you also get less zostera shoots. And then this red box here is where we place our cages. Okay, and so this is how, these are the treatments. We have four different treatments. This is the interior of the bed. And so we have a no otter mimic where we actually put a cage over that excludes the sea otters and we throw in a crab to uh, mimic, simulate a, a high sea otter or a low sea otter environment. And then we have these three treatments where, which were supposed to be in theory identical mm -hmm. or have a, a similar response where we had an otter mimic where we actually excluded both sea otters and crabs. Um, <clears throat> and then we had actual open uh, cage control and a, a cage free control where we uh, allowed crabs and sea otters and other meso predators to, to freely move in. This is what the ecotone <laughs> cage experiment looked like. So basically we did the exact same thing, but we put it over that area where it had, they had a mixture of, a, pretty much an equal mixture of ulva and seagrass. And <clears throat> I wanna highlight here that this has fish in it. Um, and so what we found, and I'll show you in a little bit, is that the, in the interior of the bed, the fish seem to be inefficient predators, or there's some sort of uh, refuge for predation within the interior because we didn't see a really strong effect from fish. But at this ecotone, you could imagine where the, now you have all this exposed zostera, fish can all of a sudden become a lot more important. <clears throat> so here are the expected results at that ecotone experiment. <clears throat> what we were expecting to see was crabs eating grazers that would lead to al algal overgrowth on the seagrass leaves and a dieback of seagrass and a proliferation of ulva <clears throat> and then the otter treatments, we were expecting to see the opposite, that you get, <clears throat> that you get a proliferation of these mesograzers, less algal overgrowth, and, and enhanced zostra. And so what we actually saw was not what we were expecting. <clears throat> what we actually saw was that in these cage, cages with crabs, what we saw was a decline in both eelgrass and ulva. The, the eelgrass declined as you would expect. There was an overgrowth of algae due to less grazers, but there was also less ulva. And what we, what we were seeing is actually these crabs actually eating that ulva, probably the going for the grazers in the ulva. <clears throat> and these otter treatments, what we saw was actually um, the, the, the expansion of both eelgrass and ulva. So both eelgrass and ulva were enhanced in the presence of sea otters. Okay, so now I'm gonna take you through the actual results to see, show you kind of how this all plays out and, the, and how what these, these trophic mechanisms actually operate differently from the interior and the edge of the bed. <coughs> so in the, in the low otter mimic here, we have a, a significantly reduced amount of grazers um, it, when you just have that crab uh, cage with the otter excluded. And then the otter inclusion, you have an, an enhancement of grazers. At the ecotone, it's, it's a little bit different because now you have ulva and what we're also seeing is you have these fish predators. And so what we're thinking is that these fish predators move in and then they can take out, they, they can take out the grazers occurring on the zostera. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden you have this ulva that is, that is expanding or enhanced in the presence of sea otters. And that ulva seems to be providing uh, the zostera with these really important grazers like amphipods and ibotia that supply the, the, this much needed uh, algal epiphyte removal for the zostera itself. And so if you look at this superficially, 
without including the differences in the, in the pr producer assemblages, you would say, okay, these grazers, the grazer assemblages look pretty, pretty um, close together between the interior and ecotone. But when you start separating it out by vegetation type, you start to realize that that ulva actually becomes pretty important. And so this result was pretty fascinating because <coughs> Th this long-standing paradigm between ulva and eelgrass or seagrass competition. Um, and what we're seeing is that you can actually get them both per persisting, co-occurring together, and not really having a harmful effect on each other. And it seems like ulva, instead of having this kind of negative effect, actually has more of a facilitating effect by producing these grazers for the zostera. Okay, and now, so we can start looking at the shoots. And the, the shoots, by looking at the shoots and the change in shoots, it actually starts telling us about the mechanisms of resilience and how this all occurs. And so <clears throat> if you get this low water mimic, you get in the interior of the bed, you actually get a decline in the shoots, right? And so the shoots are starting to collapse. <clears throat> when you get the presence of sea otters, what you get is more of the sea otters having kind of a stabilizing effect. So this is called resistance, right? So where you're actually resisting a perturbation. So there's not like there's an increase in the shoots because they're sea otters. It's, be, it's mainly the sea otters are kind of helping maintain the interior of that bed. At the ecotone, it's quite opposite. In, the, in these areas, in the, in the plots with the, just the crabs, what we saw is a pretty much a no change in shoots, right? And so there's no, there's no um, decline of the seagrass, but yet there's no expansion. However, in the presence of sea otters, you get both, um, you get this expansion occurring, and that is resilience. And so what's really neat is that you can, 50 meters apart from each other, you can get these two different aspects of resilience occurring. <coughs> okay, so now what's next? So I've talked to you a lot about sea otters in, in seagrass beds, and, um, and that's, that's been pretty cool and all. And so we've been tracking these sea otters as they move through the system. And <clears throat> every time, every year we look at the, the numbers and we're like, okay, they've reached carrying capacity. It's over. But they keep on expanding. And now they're expanding into salt marshes. And what they're doing is they're feeding on these salt marsh banks, <clears throat> along the salt marsh banks on crabs. Again, they really like to eat crabs. They're hauling out on the salt marsh. When the tide's high, they eat crabs in the salt marsh. So now they're becoming salt marsh predators right in front of our eyes. And then this is really important because as we know, um, and John Oliver will tell you all about this, Elkhorn Slough is eroding and it's eroding because we developed and we constructed a, a, a harbor at Moss Landing which is acting like a fire hose and it's creating these massive tidal forces that are increasing over time, speeding up the erosion of the system. <coughs> On top of that, we have eutrophication that is fueling these guys, Pachygraphsis crabs. And so these are pri primarily herb herbivorous crabs. They are fueled by all this ulva that we see in the system. And if you ever go kayaking or take a boat ride along Elkhorn Slough, you'll see that the banks are loaded pop marks with these crab condos. And these crab condos, what they end up doing is destabilizing the banks and in increasing the erosion of the system. So our question is now, if you're adding a top predator that likes to eat these crabs, can they actually slow down erosion? And, and can they slow down marsh loss? <clears throat> and this is huge for Elkhorn Slough because not only are the banks eroding, eroding away, but we've lost you know, maybe about 50% of the salt marsh in the system. And so what we're doing is we're tracking these sea otters throughout the system. So we're looking at their effects over this entire landscape. <coughs> and what, the way we're doing it is that we have about 20 tagged sea otters right now in the system. And so we have 24 hour surveillance on these predators. And then we're also doing things like looking at their foraging rates in the various marsh creeks and um, do, just doing basic density counts. And so we can generate, this is what Tim Tinker does, and I, he might be talking soon, I think at Moss Landing, and he'll, might tell you about how he creates these maps, these kind of heat maps that um, tell us about where the sea otters are going, how much they're eating, and this is really cool because this is kind of unprecedented for to do for a top predator in a marine type system. Um, so th this is really neat, and what we can do is 
and then what we have done is we've set up permanent transects in every major creek in Elkhorn Slough to look at how sea otter use correlates with marsh dieback and, and erosional rates in the system. On top of that, we're doing another predator exclusion experiment. So if you go out to Elkhorn Slough, you might see these cages scattered all around, around the estuary. This is a, <coughs> we're teaming up with a guy named Brian Silliman on the East Coast, who is a Mark Burnett student, and this is what they do. They, they put cages around marshes. And so this is a Mark Burnett type cage. <coughs> and we, so what we have is three different treatments where we have an otter exclusion, a procedural control, and a crab exclusion. So the crab exclusion allows us to kind of gauge how effective the sea otters are in removing the crabs. And so what we're seeing is that <coughs> sea otters, as you get more and more sea otters, we're seeing a reduction in crab density in each one of these, uh, in each one of these uh, tidal creeks. So each one of these points is a tidal creek. And this is just one year of data. This is all preliminary stuff. We're, we're doing this over a course of two years because the <coughs> salt marsh grows pretty slow and it responds pretty slowly. And so, and as well as to measure erosion adequately, you need at least a couple years. <coughs> so, we're, and this is what kind of the, the otter exclusion cages look like. This is one year after we excluded otters in a really high sea otter density environment. And what, you, what we're noticing is that the crabs are starting to use these areas as a refuge. And so they create <coughs> or maintain these burrows that were in these, in these otter exclusion cages. And the, you can see in the surrounding area, the marsh is doing quite well. And then within these cages, the, mar the marsh is actually dying back. And so <coughs> versus this is a procedural control, which is you know, the marsh is intact, pretty stable. And so what we're looking at is <coughs> comparing these otter exclusions to these procedural controls and looking at how the crab density changes over uh, summertime. So after they've recruited into the marsh, how, mu <coughs> how much more crabs do you get after the end of the summertime? And so what we see is inc an increase in these otter exclusion cages, indicating that these are predation refuges, or refugia. And then on the opposite end, we're seeing that the, in the otter exclusion cages, a decrease in the above ground biomass of the salt marsh. And we're talking primarily about salicornia, which is um, the pickleweed, it's, it's now called sarcocornia. Um, <clears throat> and so, so essentially, what the otters seem to be doing is providing, um, is, are reducing crabs that could end up you know, feeding, cre creating burrows in the marsh and uh, ca causing all sorts of havoc. So this is something that we're tracking over time. These, these are just preliminary results. There's also surprises that are happening. Um, so the, the otters, like I said, they, they haul out <coughs> onto the salt marsh and they create these really distinct signatures in the salt marsh um, vegetation, which is they kind of flatten it out. And you would think that this would be bad. It almost seems to be creating an intermediate disturbance for the salt marsh. Um, if a harbor seal moves in, and this is what we see with the harbor seal areas, is that they just kind of clear out that spot because they're so fat. But the <laughs> otters are, uh, the otters are only like 100 pounds or so, right? And so they, they just kind of create this depression. And then they poop, and then they pee. And they actually seem to be fertilizing the marsh. So we're looking at um, the, the sable isotope signature in these areas that, that sea otters use, and also looking at the carbon signature to see if there is this enhancement in the salt marsh. OK, now this is where things get a little bit different. I'm going to start talking about fish. <coughs> Enough about those sea otters. OK, <coughs> so this is looking at resilience through the lens of the estuarine nursery function. and. <coughs> You know, I've talked about this main driver of agricultural runoff causing eutrophication, leading to, the, and this is overly dramatic. That's not even Elkhorn Slough, so don't worry. We never see that in Elkhorn Slough, but um, you get the point. And so what's been, what's been the difficulty in, in fish ecology and, and fishery science is making the connection between land use to the nursery to the offshore fishery, right? And so <coughs> this is, my attempt to do so. Um, <clears throat> just to show you kind of what hypoxia in Elkhorn Slough is like in comparison to all the other estuaries <coughs> in the United States. 
This is not all the actuaries, but this is um, a handful of them. This is about 30. These are all the NERS. And <coughs> right here is Elkhorn Slough. And so basically, this is a pretty um, common uh, signature of, of hypoxia. So this is the, the 10th percentile of dissolved oxygen. So this is how low the dissolved oxygen can go in that system. Um, <coughs> and then over, and this is over a course of about two years for each one of these points. And so if you fall below this line, the chances are that <coughs> your system is somewhat eutrophic or nutrient loaded and you have hypoxia issues. And here's Elkhorn Slough, and you can see that it behaves much like a estuary at 30 degrees latitude, which would be like San Diego or even south of that. Um, <coughs> so it's a hypoxic system. Um, it's also been described as a hyperventilating system. So um, <coughs> hyperventilating meaning in, uh, in, at night, it takes a deep breath in, sucks out all the oxygen, and then whoosh, lets it all out during the day when, uh, when it's producing. <coughs> and so what we can do is take this information, and there's a guy named Greg Caillé who sent out his students um, for a period of about 40 years or so to go collect um, fish samples in Elkhorn Slough. And <coughs> a, a couple of us, former Moss Landing students, actually took that data and tried to put good use to it. And so what we ended up doing was matching all of these fish surveys with a water quality survey done at around the same time in approximately the same location. And asked the question, okay, given that dissolved oxygen condition, what's the probability of finding a fish? And for this case, we're focusing in on English sole. And I'm gonna tell you why in a second. So what you see, this is the deep channel, which just means I did an otter trawl there. And then this is the shallow margin, the dark line, which means I did a beach seine. But um, <coughs> what you can see is that consistently there's a, the, it, the lower the dissolved oxygen goes, the less probability there is of finding one of these fish. And the reason I'm showing you just English sole is because <coughs> English sole is this uh, poster species for nursery functioning on our coast. Um, so English sole likes to use estuaries as its primary nursery grounds. And that's, um, that holds true for Elkhorn Slough as well. There was a woman named Jennifer Brown who did her PhD at UCSC on uh, the nursery role of Elkhorn Slough. She did this, these really cool techniques with otolith chemistry to trace adults in the Monterey Bay region back to Elkhorn Slough. And she found that about 50% of adults found in the offshore region of Elkhorn Slough used, or Monterey Bay used Elkhorn Slough as its nursery ground. So that was a powerful result, and we can actually take that result and, and use it to our advantage. <coughs> and so what's really interesting about the slough, and this kind of gets back to that resilience, those resilience aspects, is that we have this exponential increase in the nutrients in the system. However, the dissolved oxygen doesn't follow that same pattern. A lot of places, a lot of estuaries on the planet usually follow almost the dissolved oxygen or hypoxia will follow nutrient loading. In this system, it doesn't. And so you get these period, this is a dissolved oxygen anomaly. So basically, if you fall below this line, it means that, uh, that conditions are um, <coughs> below the average, essentially. And then above, the blue is normoxic conditions, so pretty good or normal conditions. And so you would expect that you would see a bunch of red. But what you see here is a bunch of red mixed with blue. And so we can use that dissolved oxygen anomaly <coughs> and say, OK, we, and then use Greg's um, data set and go, okay, we found a fish at this point. Was it normoxic or hypoxic? <coughs> and what we see is that during these normoxic conditions, that there's about a fourfold increase in uh, <coughs> the juvenile abundance of English soul in the estuary. <coughs> so that's an important result because we can relate it to the offshore population. And so if we look at a one year lag <coughs> to the offshore population, and say, okay, how many offshore, uh, offshore recruits are, are joining this population after normoxic years or hypoxic years? What we see is that there's a significant increase in the recruitment after normoxic periods. And then this ends up translating into an increase in the, in the fishery yields for the offshore region. So now we're actually making this linkage from the nurse, from actually the land to the nursery, to the offshore, and ultimately to the fishery. <coughs> so 
the question still remains about what's driving the resilience in the nursery. And it turns out <coughs> that what's driving the resilience in the nursery is El Nino. And it's through multiple different pathways. And so I don't know if you've ever seen, this is a structural equation model, which you guys might be learning about in your stats classes. Um, it's a multiple regression on steroids, essentially. And so <coughs> it's, you take, you can take these, these different factors and do what's called a path analysis to look at a response variable or at several response vari variables like dissolved oxygen. And so <laughs> what happens on this coast, or at least in Elkhorn Slough, is when you get a strong El Nino, you get increased precipitation, that draws down the salinity in the estuary, <coughs> which ends up flushing the system out. So during dry years, you get all this, you get actually all this accumulation of organic junk that wreaks havoc on hypoxic conditions in the estuary. And so you get that, that flushing event, those flushing events from El Ninos, and it increases um, the dissolved oxygen in the system. And then if you also get a strong, uh, a windy year that mixes up the water column really well, then you get improved dissolved oxygen conditions. And so that's primary, that's the majority of the estuary. There's also areas in the lower estuary that do not fit that pattern, and that's because there's a canyon right out there that is <coughs> pumping um, in big, these big upwelling years, will pump in low DO water over the continental shelf and into the estuary. And so that can lower the dissolved oxygen as well. And so what we know about El Ninos <coughs> is that not only can they do this flushing thing with precipitation, but they can actually suppress um, upwelling in these coastal regions because you get this warm layer, layer that essentially stops um, the upwelling from occurring. And so there's actually a couple different pathways by which El Nino can influence the hypoxic conditions of the estuary. And this is kind of strange because a lot of times we think of El Ninos and, and coastal regions as being bad things, they're like recruitment, and they live out kelp forest, and they, you know, they, so they do all these bad things, but in this system it actually appears to be doing a good thing for at least the dissolved oxygen conditions. <coughs> So in conclusion, um, <coughs> yes, coastal systems are under anthropogenic threats. We can just go look at our coastal landscape here and see that. Um, <coughs> and so this can have consequences to things that we humans depend on and care about, like um, ecosystem services. And so this is why some of us go and study these systems. <coughs> the return of otters to California estuaries has great potential to restore functioning and resilience to these threatened systems. And <coughs> otters are, you know, there's, there's sea otters, there's not sea otters everywhere on the planet, but they can act as a model predator because they feed at similar trophic levels as other top predators that have been declining in other systems, like sharks and cod and other large game fish. <coughs> and then ultimately, Climate can have these really strong mediating effects to these uh, to these systems that are under threat, and <coughs> this is important because uh, when you think of climate change and how it's going to influence all these different indices that are having huge effects on these coastal systems. So in, in San Francisco Bay, for example, it's precipitatal oscillations and something called the North Pacific Gyre oscillation that have these huge effects on the recruitment of important species in that system. So we have really a really poor understanding of how climate change is gonna affect these large scale processes. And so ultimately that's gonna have consequences for these ecosystem services. So we need to figure this stuff out. Um, and I'm, I'm not a modeler, so um, somebody else is gonna have to do it. But um, <coughs> somebody's got, one of you physical oceanographers <coughs> is gonna have to do that, okay. <coughs> So that's it. I'm going to just thank a few people. Um, my PhD advisors, Kirsten Watson and Pete Ramundi, um, who were incredibly awesome during the last seven to eight years. And then my new postdoc advisors, Christy Croker and Brian Silliman. Um, and then I have to thank all my committee members, Susan, Mark, Kim, Mike, and Lillian. And then I had a bunch of collaborators on all of this. And a lot of these. People, folks are from the ML MLers or were. Um, Nora was was a former beer pig as well. Um, Camille, who's still here, um, <coughs> and then um, on this fish collaboration, and you know we have Matt Levy, 
who was in Greg's lab, and Aaron Carlisle, who was in Greg's lab as well. And we've, we've gone on to do a bunch of collaborations, which has been a lot of fun. Um, <coughs> and then I have to thank all the volunteers. Like The, the cool thing about being at UC Santa Cruz, there's so many eager volunteers to get out and do this work. They have, they have a great diving program there um, <coughs> that trains at least 60 um, new scientific divers every single year. And so, and they're just eager to get wet. And so, um, so yeah, so they're, and they're out there, they're getting muddy, they're getting wet. Sometimes they actually get um, attacked by harbor seals, like this guy, Umi, um, he ended up being okay. But, uh, and then there's these guys, Ron and Robert, who are these hardcore <laughs> um, permanent volunteers at Elkhorn Sioux. And, and then just the, uh, a great team of undergrads. Sometimes I, um, <coughs> break child labor laws and bring my daughter out. Uh, so it's, it's been really great to work with all the undergrads and, and grad students and volunteers. It's been a real, a real joy for me. And so with that, thank you. Let's have questions. Flatfish, but we don't know how effective the flatfish are predators in that system. But it's Leptocotus and the Shiner perch. What we, which, and so now we're doing these these mesocosm experiments with um, Christy Croker, looking at predation of the Shiner perch in these systems to see if they are these big predators. And then on top of that, we're looking at how ocean acidification influences the whole kind of structure of the system. Um, so it's it's something that I want to explore a little bit more is what's the role of these fish predators. Yeah, I was just curious because I know that uh, Dave Ambrose and Brooke Andrew did feeding habits for their master's thesis <laughs> on flatfishes for Dave and surf perches for Brooke. Yeah. And it was in that paper we did with Jim Barry. Yeah, the E3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I'm, I'm familiar with that okay. paper. Yeah. Did you ever look at the Yogamara Speds down off of Del Monte? Yes, I, I've been there, and Dick Zimmerman's been there a bunch, and Diana Stella's been there a bunch, and, <clears throat> and that's, they think that's actually a different species of, of seagrass, um, that's uh, Zostra asiatica, and um, I want to go back there and see what's going on in that system, because it's, it's, it, I know that it was pretty, it was a big bed up until the 90s, and they had this limpid outbreak. So we did we did a study in, on the tidal flushing effect, and it has big effects mm -hmm. on. It depends on where you're at in the estuary, like right by your house, flushing. There is none, and so that was like some of the more hypoxic areas in the in the estuary. You get that hydrogen sulfide, and it, it gets nasty, and so um, that does have an effect. But the, so the tidal prism is increasing, mm -hmm. and um, but what's interesting is that. The still kind of fluctuates through time. So I, I would imagine there's, there's probably some sort of effect with the tidal prism mm -hmm. as well. And, um, and that's why I think we're also getting more of this upwell water coming into the estuary. And so we get the signal all the way up to almost seal bend. We have some um, big upwelling periods. We'll see that signal go all the way in. Yeah, Scott. Is there any evidence that the sort of nursery value of the seal has Fishes has changed with the recovery of the eelgrass? Is it, is it better yeah. now, or is it, do yeah. you see that signal with all the other environmental tools? Yeah, I, we, so far we don't. And so, and this is kind of the next avenue of research that I kind of want to go down, is looking at how these habitats, we get, we get more seagrass, you know, it's not a duck, it's not whatever, 
So if you just get more seagrass, do you get enhanced nursery? Um, and that, I think that is kind of unknown on this coast. It's, uh, it's different than estuaries, where the kelps are probably um, you know, pretty well understood. But uh, <coughs> that, we, we don't know. We've seen an overall decline in, in the flatfish. Um, so that's, Or they won't expand, is kind of what happens. And so having epiphytes on seagrass in the summertime and shallow water environments is actually pretty normal. Um, so that's why you know looking at Tomales Bay and seeing that system where that seagrass, the seagrass beds in Tomales Bay have been some of the most stable on this coast. And so um, that that result of looking at those epiphytes just kind of <coughs> indicates that it looks unhealthy, right? But it's actually <coughs> And so seeing Elkhorn, that was Elkhorn seeing the summertime with that video. Mm -hmm. And seeing that is actually kind of shocking. Like, where are the, where's, where's the epiphytes here? And so um, <coughs> that, I think, is what's leading to the, to the fast expansion. And so, um, <coughs> but these systems where there's nutrient loading, like Elkhorn Slough or Tomorrow Bay, and as you move down south, and temperature and, and eutrophication become much more of an issue, they're highly variable through time. And so they're very unstable. And so, you know, who knows, I'll come see collapsing, right? And then who knows, you might get tipping points at some point where it's like, there's too many nutrients or it's a bad year. So who, yeah. Yeah, I had a question about sea otters when you bring it up. Um, <laughs> because I've been here a long time and Mark Stevenson did his master's on sea otter growth yeah. on the pier when it was up. And then they also documented, I guess they were rogue males that came up from the kelp forest down south <laughs> in the mid to mid 70s. That could very well be, or it could have been a mixture of clams and crabs. So they, right. it, it depends on the system, right? So there, there have been systems where they'll move in and take out crabfish. And then the crab the crab fishery is much higher. And there's other systems, as John knows about these systems, where they'll take out the, the clams first, for sure. Yeah. But what's amazing is that they're still pulling out these really big clams. <laughs> I don't know how they're doing it. But yeah, they're, uh, yeah, in the, in the estuary. Gators. They're, they're still, so the, these clams are amazing. They're still there. I don't know how, but. And it's not true with the pizzanos. The pizzanos no. are really yeah. valuable. Their sizes are like two inches max. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> that's a keen observation. And a lot of people will look at not, so you get these rogue males, right? And they, right. they seem in Humboldt Bay, they seem down in Mexico. Um, <clears throat> but what I think the important thing is when you get that established population. And so that's what happens. A small population moved in, and so and they've increased since. And they, yeah, dramatically. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I was curious. You you said that Kathy Gap was in shallow water stuff. Yeah. So how do you get that effect that you got from these fluid islands in the mouth? Do they ever get back in that equilibrium at all? So they look like they're, they're nocturnal, and so they come out of their holes at night, go down to the channel and feed, and then that's when the otters move in. They, they, they tune into the whole thing, but that's where, you, where at night you, and then or early in the morning you'll see all the otters in the creeks because mm -hmm. they've been feeding on these crabs, these nocturnal crabs that go down into the creek channels to feed. So that bareness in those areas that you recruited otters and you had lots of crab bites, yeah. that was not that bareness wasn't the result of them eating the crabs, was it? Well, it could be. We don't know that yet. So we haven't done, we haven't split the, enough crab litter to figure this out. And that's what we, there's a lot of stuff. Things that we need to do, and then we, that's why the uh, uh, it's not even yeah. yeah so. But more holes, more erosion. More holes, more erosion. erosion. Right. Yeah. You may you may find a lot of major erosion because so much of it is at the side. Yeah. No. I mean, that's what we're finding. Not be anywhere near that. And that's. And then all of a sudden it'll go. Yeah. The, we we saw we did the one year and we didn't see any patterns. That's why we chose one year for data. 
And then two, yeah. So it might take you five years. Where you don't have them, you really can't say anything. Right. Because you have them to make them whole. Right, yeah. Because well, isn't there a master chief in that? Mark Swigen or somebody? Did He's not looking at Roger Wilson. 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 But aren't there other long-term relationships? Aren't there other long-term relationships? Who's in a lunchbox? Questions back here? <laughs> They'll just continue their conversation. This is like a So it, it depends on how much mud flat is created in a, in a certain sort of depth range. And so um, potentially you could, um, <coughs> but the, the eel grass is really kind of stuck to these areas where there's historically present or where there's been available mud flat over a good period of time. So well, yeah, I don't know. I don't those know. are historical, those weed beds. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the beds were hundreds of times larger. Yeah. And now they're down a little bit. Eventually, it's all post because they suck so slowly. Yeah. I have a question, Brian. Yeah. So, do you still think the fluffy otters would be so important if you stopped the jump cuts for nitrate? But that's a great question. And no, we don't think so. We, we think that that effect is really strongly coupled with a strong. So, your curiosity and fascination with otters is itself anthropogenic. <laughs> <laughs> what we're doing, we're expanding this research. You know, we're looking at other systems that are not in future. And we're seeing similar patterns, but the mechanism is not there. So that it's that epiphyte phaser crab mechanism is just so you need. I think really think you need that eutrophication to have that effect, or else it's a yeah. But you get enough of that in aqua with the Ken Johnson's data. Yeah, so it's <laughs> feel all of the growth you've seen. Yeah, yeah. That. You, you perhaps, know, perhaps. Thirty. I mean, that's perhaps the loading. It's about fifty-fifty. I mean, for just 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 the uh, grass for, for the ulva to grow. Oh, right, yeah, right, for the right. Ulva to grow. <laughs> yes, yes. So you might get that that upwelling could have a strong effect, but like moss bay, that's 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 exactly what you're seeing with moss bay. It's a huge upwelling system. Uh, and not like ours. Remember, Ken Johnson stuff goes down and gets this breaks the internal waves in the head of the canyon and it brings yeah. up nutrient rich water yeah. almost yeah. every high tide. Yeah, no, that it's was a huge. cool. Yeah. About 50% of the, the load 